Um, all right, well, uh, welcome everybody out there in internet land to uh, this week's exciting uh, webinar. Um, my name is Dr. Ben Dolorado. I'm the laboratory director at Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. And this week we're uh, presenting uh, with Dr. Tara Travis and her presentation is preserving and exhibiting jewelry from Mary Coulter. So uh, before we get started, there's a few background and logistical things I'd like to uh, talk with you all about to help improve your viewing experience uh, in particular. And you know, over the last year and a half or so, a lot of us out there have gotten really familiar with the Zoom video conferencing program. But in case you haven't, in case you're new to this, I'll give you a couple of tips that might enhance and improve your viewing experience. Um, so the first thing is you can move the talking head. So at least on my screen of Zoom, when it comes up in the upper right, there's a series of, of heads and you can see myself talking and Tara and, and Taylor. Um, but if those are in your way for whatever reason, you can actually take your cursor and grab those and, and move them around to different parts of your screen and, and try different configurations so they won't be in your way. <clears throat> um, so you can also uh, utilize, there's a live transcription service, and that's really helpful if you're having any issues, either, um, you know, any type of issues hearing what, what Dr. Travis has to say. Uh, it's kind of like subtitles at the bottom of your screen, and that's really helpful, um, but it does have some difficulties, just, you know, with Native American place names, um, and then often sometimes some of the jargon that the archaeologists tend to use. So if things a little, get a little muddled there, you'll understand why, but it's a great service. Um, and then also, uh, you can ask questions in our Q&A, and Dr. Travis has opted to, as people often do, to limit uh, or postpone the questions till the end of the presentation. But if you have some burning question and you don't want to forget it, uh, you can look for this, this series of this little bar here that has chat, raise hand, and Q&A. If you click on that Q&A, you can go ahead and type in your question. Um, and throughout the presentation, our, our webinar guru, Taylor Hashbrook and I will be compiling those questions uh, into you know, like uh, sets of, of, of uh, inquiries, and uh, then we'll we'll try to get to as many of those as we can at the end of the presentation. So you know you can go ahead and put those in there. And if you're having difficulties uh, seeing the presentation or hearing things, you can also head over to the live stream version of this uh, at crocanium.org/facebook. And on of the Facebook live stream, it's really it's like a one or two second delay, so it's really like being there in person, and you can even type in some questions. Uh, in that format. <clears throat> and then finally, um, we invite you to subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. And, uh, you know, I know after the presentation, you're probably going to want to revisit this over and over and again and again. Um, or if you want to see some of our previous webinars, they're all up on our, our YouTube channel. And so we invite you to like and subscribe also. And that helps us to unlock uh, different features that, that also help enhance the viewing experience. So uh, go ahead and, and check out our uh, procandy.org slash YouTube channel to get the chance. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Crow Canyon, uh, we are uh, sponsoring this webinar series uh, and also we're working with a bunch of partners on this. And our campus is just outside of Cortez, Colorado. And here you can see a, a picture of our beautiful campus right in front of the Sleeping Youth Mountain. And our mission is to empower present and future generations by making the past, sorry, the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. And you can uh, find us and find more information on our programs at crocanyon.org. And um, hopefully soon you'll be able to actually come and visit our campus as well. Uh, if you want to participate in some of our education and uh, research programs. So check us out. We also, um, you know, over the last year and a half, uh, land acknowledgements have become a really, you know, prominent theme in, in webinars and, and presentations, particularly in archaeology and some other fields. And we like to use this as an opportunity to acknowledge uh, all the different indigenous folks uh, in particular that have lived in these places where we now live and reside. And no, chances are no matter where you live in North America, you probably are, are 
living and working on lands that once belonged to other people. So we, we really think it's important to acknowledge that. So at Crow Canyon Archaeological Center, we acknowledge that uh, the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, uh, Diné, and also known as Navajo, and the Hickory of Apache people on whose uh, traditional homelands this institution sits and upon uh, which we work and reside. Now, our mission-related work would not be possible without Indigenous people in the past, the present, and the future, and we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant Indigenous communities for their contributions to all of humankind. And Crow Canyon is, is grateful to all Indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Now, as I said, you know, no matter where you are in uh, North America in particular, chances are, you know, the lands you're on probably belong to some other people at some point in time. And so we encourage you also to, you know, maybe do some research and think about that and see, uh, you know, no matter where you are, check that out. Um, so our this webinar series would not be possible without our viewers, obviously, and you really do make all the difference and, and make this possible. So we uh, ask you if you if you'd like and if you're able to to please consider a donation to the Crow Canyon Annual Fund when you register for one of our webinars. And uh, a Crow Canyon trustee who, who really generously has has made a fifty thousand dollar challenge match for 2021. So every dollar you contribute. Um, in support of the Discover Archaeology webinar series, we matched up to $50,000. This has been going on uh, most of 2021. And as you can see, we're already every every week, this, this bumps up this, this temperature gauge. And so we're at 66% of our goal, and we're at $33,345. So uh, if you want to contribute, basically every dollar will get matched. So um, please, if you, if you can do that. But you can also make a difference in a lot of other ways. And, you know, of course, over the course of the pandemic, things have been really hard for everybody. Uh, but they've been particularly hard for Indigenous peoples. Uh, but you can help to offset those difficulties uh, in a, through, through donations. And so we just have a few of the, the local um, uh, Indigenous uh, communities uh, relief funds, their official relief funds listed here. And so when you come back to see Dr. Travis's presentation um, again and again, you can tune into this page also and get the, uh, the official contacts for them. But so some of the local um, uh, sites you can contribute to are the Pueblo Relief Fund, the Hopi Relief Fund, the Navajo and Hopi Families COVID Relief Fund, and the official Navajo Nation COVID-19 Relief Fund. Um, and then also think, you know, in your local communities, there are probably similar uh, organizations set up so you could find something maybe a little, a little more local to you if you prefer, but we, we definitely encourage you to uh, donate if you can. Um, so then uh, transitioning back to the, the webinars, we have uh, a couple of really exciting webinars coming up in the next couple of weeks uh, for the uh, September 9th, which is uh, two Thursdays from now. Uh, we have Ancient Ornithology and Continuity of the Four Corners, Prehistoric and Historic Puebloan Relationships with Birds, presented by um, Chuck LaRue. And Chuck is a good friend of mine. He's an incredible scholar, um, a wildlife biologist and by training, uh, grew up on the Hopi Reservation, and then also uh, is a budding archaeologist and uh, should be just a really fascinating and exciting presentation. So I invite you to tune in uh, September 9th, that's Thursday, um, Thursday and it's uh, at 4 p.m. And then and the following week, we have another really exciting presentation, uh, tracing the origins of Chaco, uh, uh, sorry, tracing the origins of Chaco and beans from Chaco Canyon to Aztec Great Houses uh, with Dr. Chris Guterman. And Chris is also a friend of mine. Um, we went to school together at University of Arizona at the Laboratory of Treating Research. He's an incredible dendro uh, chronologist and figured out some really exciting ways that we can look at some of those. 240,000 beams that were imported in Chaco Canyon um, and see where they came from. So definitely tune into that. That's Thursday, September 16th at 4 p.m. Um, so now with um, all of that said, uh, uh, to I'm bringing you to this evening's uh, presentation, uh, which is preserving and exhibiting jewelry from uh, 
Mary Coulter with Dr. Tara Travis. So I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Travis here. So uh, Dr. Tara Travis is a public historian whose work has focused on the Four Corners region. And she's works with tribal communities, managing museum collections, designing and installing exhibits, and promoting historic preservation. In her current position as the Supervisory Museum Curator at Mesa Verde National Park and Yucca House National Monument, she's directed the move, which is an astronomical effort, um, uh, directed the move of the museum collection and the installation of, of exhibits at the new Visitor and Research Center in Mesa Verde National Park. And more recently, uh, she shepherded the gift of the estate of David Rockefeller uh, from the collection of David and Peggy Rockefeller. So prior to this position, she served uh, for 10 years as an ethno historian uh, in the National Park Service Office of Indian Affairs and American Culture. So we are really pleased to have Dr. Travis join us this evening. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to thank her for coming and uh, turn the presentation over, over to, to Tara. So thank you so much. Hey, thank you so much. I just want to do a shout out to Pro Canyon. I was saying earlier that these webinars really fed my brain during uh, the shutdown, and I, I appreciate the work that they do and the opportunity that they've provided to me. And I also want to thank our tribal communities and the 26 uh, traditionally associated communities with Mesa Verde National Park, the tribal artisans who created these beautiful silver cultural items are uh, to be acknowledged, and we appreciate their artistry and skill. I'm going to go share a screen now if everyone's ready. So hold on just a minute when we'll start the slideshow. So can everyone see this? No, we're not seeing it just yet. Okay. Let me get out for a minute. And Sorry about this. Let me try to share screen again. Perfect, you're coming through now. Great, okay, okay. Now we just wanna start from the beginning. There we go. Yep. yep. Thank You're you. Sorry for, that, sorry for that moment of technical difficulty. So uh, the question here is to polish or not to polish Mary Coulter's silver jewelry. And um, hold on just a second, pardon me. All right, now we had more te technical difficulty, but um, as you can see, uh, we've it's a difficult question and it's more complex than you might originally think. And it begins with Mary Coulter and her association with Mesa Verde National Park. And I wanted to start by saying, we're gonna clip along pretty quick here because I want to cover uh, the project in particular and focus on the public's questions on you all's questions about the work and the project and how we're approaching uh, whether to polish or not and how much to polish and how we approach this. So pardon me for being rather brief about Mary Coulter. Uh, so she is a well-known uh, 20th century architect. She was working in the early 1900s and really in a field that was dominated by men and she was one of the first to want to incorporate indigenous design elements into her architecture. And she is associated with the National Park Service, particularly Grand Canyon National Park because of her designs for the Hopi House and uh, Hermit's Rest. So we don't always think of Mary Coulter being associated with Mesa Verde. So I'm gonna give you just a little bit of information about her association with this place and why she might've selected our park for her donation of 
jewelry that was worn by her and important to her. Uh, so um, she, in the middle of her career, really the height of her career, I should say in the 1930s, she was given the opportunity by her boss, Fred Harvey, to take a sabbatical and to tour the Southwest and look at indigenous architecture and the ancestral Pueblo past to gain inspiration and ideas that would eventually result in the uh, Grand Canyon Watchtower structure. So on this journey, she created notebooks, she took photographs, and she was influenced by many sites in the Southwest, uh, including Mesa Verde. Here she is descending on a ladder into uh, the Kiva at Spruce Tree House. She also wrote a very interesting document in one of her notebooks called Mesa Verde, the Green Tableland in December of 1933. And I, I can't read it all to you, but it's, it's slightly romantic and it's, um, you can really get a sense for how much she loved Mesa Verde, how it influenced her thinking. And I'll read to you the final paragraph. The Indian Watchtower owes a debt to Mesa Verde window and door openings and the original Kiva ceiling in square tower ruin were studied closely for use in the building. Several painted wall decorations were copied in the tower and the proportion and lines of the tower itself were suggested by the gracious round tower of Cliff Palace. The masonry of the round tower was not followed. On account of the greater size of the watchtower, it required a more rugged style to maintain a correct scale. Also, being exposed to wind and weather, the watchtower would naturally have been built of sterner stuff than was the sheltered Cliff Palace structure. Uh, if you look at the top of the document, it says, well, from a proud tower is the town that looks gigantically down. So you can see she's, she's uh, taking sort of a romantic uh, and not necessarily appropriate look at the past, uh, but she was definitely influenced by Mesa Verde in the design of what is considered her masterpiece. So here are some photographs from her sabbatical at Mesa Verde. This is Farview House showing the tower in Kiva. This is Cliff Palace, of course, with some detailed photography. And there's the round tower. Some of her details. So how did she get involved with Mesa Verde? Well, she may have been influenced by Jesse Nussbaum, whom she met while working in San Diego at the um, California, I'm sorry, the, uh, the exposition that was there in San Diego. And she, uh, I love this picture of Jesse Nussbaum, by the way, all dappered up with his white pants and his, and his hat. But um, yeah, so Nussbaum was hired as the construction manager for this project, the Panama California Exposition in San Diego. I finally got it right. Anyway, and Mary Coulter worked on the construction design and then he was involved in its execution along with Julian Martinez, who was married to Maria Martinez from San Ildefonso Pueblo. So she had a friendship with Jesse Nussbaum who was superintendent, eventually superintendent of Mesa Verde during three different episodes of his life. And also he was the first consulting departmental archeologist for the Department of the Interior. Here's Jesse Nussbaum with A.V. Kidder. So it kind of shows you he had, his, he had his Santa Fe personality and his Mesa Verde personality. I think this is a comical photo intentionally. They're, they're, they're goofing around. So it's interesting to note that 
when you look at the Chapin Mesa Archaeological Museum at Mesa Verde National Park, You'll notice there is sort of a Santa Fe style to it. It's considered a modified Pueblo Revival style building. And it uses rusticated masonry and, and several elements of the Santa Fe Pueblo Revival style. And one wonders what the influences were on Jesse Nussbaum, how much communication he might have had with Mary Coulter in the design of the building. I'm interested in that topic. But as you can see here, this is an early view of Chapin Mesa Museum from 1924. Here is Jesse Nussbaum in a traditional adobe structure in Northern New Mexico. And you can kind, you, this is from one of his uh, architectural notebooks. And you can see how some of his design, you know, his influence, he was influenced by New Mexican architecture and, and by the Pueblo, uh, New Mexico, influences and th those end up in the museum. And here's some other features of the interior of the museum. Okay, so uh, before Mesa Verde acquired her jewelry, uh, she held an exhibition in Santa Fe in 1953 at the museum of, uh, hold on just a minute. Let me see, at the Laboratory of Anthropology, that's right. And she, she discussed her jewelry and um, gave several examples of, of how, you know, stories around how she acquired certain pieces. Um, according to Fred Harvey's great grandson, Stuart Harvey, he says, sometimes she wore very simple clothes, always with a jacket, but no jewelry or anything. And at other times she loaded on the jewelry like you wouldn't believe rings on every finger, including her thumb, sometimes multiple rings on a finger. And the few times I, I stared at her, she would bring me over and she would comment on each ring. Each ring was a treasure and either you would be interested or you would be dismissed. So you better be interested. So uh, you get a sense of how she might've worn the jewelry. So in 1954, she bequeathed her jewelry to Mesa Verde National Park, and it was immediately put on exhibit at the Chapin Mesa Museum. And I wanted to bring this point up because I stepped into a bit of a controversy uh, while I was working a couple years ago. I started getting calls asking about Mary Coulter's jewelry and the calls were along the lines of why have you never exhibited it? What is the park doing to ensure its care? Um, and there were just a lot of rumors going around. Basically, the, a rumor had started that the park had never exhibited her jewelry and wasn't doing a good job and in making it available to the public and they were concerned about its care. It culminated in me actually going and giving a talk at a friends group of a major museum in Santa Fe, and the room was packed. I must have had 200 people there, and as you can tell, it wasn't because I was the world's greatest speaker. It was because there was so much interest in her jewelry and uh, confusion as to what had happened to it. And I can, I can, I think I know what happened when she donated this assemblage of jewelry to Mesa Verde National Park. She specifically requested that we not refer to it as the Mary Coulter Jewelry Collection. And the park very faithfully did not. And so when it went on exhibit at Chapin Mesa Museum, we focused the park, focused on the culture groups that produced these cultural items. It was focused on the Pueblo community. So we had one panel that exhibited Zuni jewelry. Another was Hopi, another was Navajo. There were panels on the types of materials that were used to create these cultural items. And so I think because we did not have a exhibit panel that said these had been donated by Mary Coulter, I don't think the general public knew where or how we acquired them, but it was at her 
request. And I, you can speculate why, because she did not explain why in her donation letter, but she did have a hand in these original exhibits. She was unable to travel, but photographs were taken, and these, these probably are the photographs that were in uh, her donation folder in the park. And they were taken, they were shown to her, and so she had the opportunity to comment. So she must have approved of and liked how the park was emphasizing the descended communities of Mesa Verde National Park. So here are some other examples of the exhibit. Here's some of the source materials that I talked about. And so if you think about it, these objects went on exhibit almost immediately after they were donated. And here is a sketch of how they were being exhibited. I know it's, it's kind of, you know, it's not very grand, but you can see that they have how the exhibit cases were oriented and if you look at the left side of your screen and how the panels went into the museum space. So they, they remained on exhibit until Mission 66, until around 1958, when there was a steady increase in the visitor populations in national parks. In fact, there was population pressure on the national parks for the first time. And Mesa Verde responded, as many parks did, by a building program called Mission 66. And the result at Mesa Verde National Park is a far view visitor center. I mean, yes, it, it's the far view visitor center and this is where the new exhibits were installed. So what happened was all of the cultural items that Mary Coulter had donated went back on exhibit at the Farview Visitor Center. And here are some photos right after installation. Uh, they're a little bit staged, but they give you a sense of how, once again, how the items were used and exhibited. And an important note, everything that was donated was exhibited. So, you already have a couple of years at the Chapin Mesa Museum where they were in non-environmental cases and they were moved to these new cases at the Farview Visitor Center, but there was also no active environmental controls within these cases. She also donated pottery that she had, you know, Pueblo ceramics that she had had in her home. And so, those also went on exhibit. But once again, there's no mention of the name Mary Coulter. And this is how the cultural groups are represented. Lots of plexiglass and felt. The text that you see on the left is from the exhibit. And notice they're making a connection between the ancestral Pueblo people who resided in Mesa Verde, and we have examples of prehistoric jewelry and contemporary jewelry. So in 2013, we, we had completed, the Park Service had completed construction of the new Visitors and Research Center or VRC. And the Farview Visitor Center went offline because we had a new visitor center down at the park entrance. And so this was our opportunity to deinstall this exhibit. And it was during the beginning of the deinstallation of Farview was the only time during the move of the museum collection that I actually halted the work. We started to deinstall, and I 
I saw problems. Um, I saw things that had me really concerned. Uh, some objects had been glued to their plexiglass exhibit mounts, um, twisted wire, twisted wire, you know, cotton. There were, there were necklaces strung with cotton that were hung on wires. So you can imagine what was happening. The cotton was being cut just through the gravity of resting on the wire and was threatened with coming, you know, breaking. And so taking a really hard look at this, I decided we needed to bring in professional conservators to help in the deinstallation in order not to do any further damage to, to these cultural items. And not all of them were misappropriately exhibited, but many just rested on plexiglass. But there were these examples that I just mentioned that were of concern to me. And it showed how much the Park Service had loved and exhibited uh, this assemblage of jewelry and the, how much uh, time all of these items had spent in non-environmentally controlled spaces. And so we really need to, we needed to pause. Um, I think that this might be how things started with the rumor that we weren't exhibiting because we took a pause in 2013 to understand what was going on with these objects and make a plan for their preservation and potential conservation work in the future. So um, this is where are we now? So we did start exhibiting uh, donated items from Mary Coulter in the new exhibits at the Visitor and Research Center, those that were in stable and in good enough condition. So we have continuously exhibited Mary Coulter's donation since literally the day that it came in through the doors of the park. Here's another example of one of our exhibit cases down at the VRC. This is a piece made out of ground and polished phonograph records. Mary Coulter was very interested in the use of materials and she really enjoyed the creativity of Native artists and how they would reuse materials sometimes. So this is part of the VRC exhibit. So we realized we needed to engage in a jewelry conservation project. These are some of the goals of the project, study and evaluation, condition assessment, documentation, mitigate any damage, consider future protection and conservation treatments, uh, passive or uh, minimal preservation techniques that staff could use or complete on their own in the future, and also an interpretive and educational component along with public demonstrations by our conservators and an online exhibit. So I'm hello. I'm Stephanie Cashman, whoops, one whoops, of whoops, the whoops. conservators working on the Mary Coulter collection. Let me stop that and go to a different format so that you can hear one of our conservators for the National Park Service talking about some of the problems uh, with silver and silver tarnish. So I am going to stop sharing here and go over here. Conservators. Cashman, one of the other conservators working on the Mary Coulter collection from Mesa Verde National Park. I'm hearing I'm the, hearing audio, the audio, audio, Tara, but I'm not I'm seeing not anything yet. Yeah, hold on just a minute. Sorry. Okay, let me go back. This happens when the metal reacts with sulfur in the air. A dark Oops. Layer. A coal burning plant near Mesa Verde is a significant source. Of okay.
Now, can you see it? Yes, I can see it now. This collection is primarily silver jewelry pieces that have tarnished. Tarnish is a dark surface appearance, like the one seen on this object here. This happens when the metal reacts with sulfur in the air, forming a dark sulfide layer. A coal burning plant near Mesa Verde is a significant source of sulfur pollution for this collection. Relative humidity also affects the tarnish rate. Silver tarnishes faster as the relative humidity increases. Ideally, silver should be stored in an environment where the relative humidity is below 50% with the object wrapped in a special material called silver cloth. This fabric is imbued with silver particles that preferentially react with the sulfur in the air before it can reach. <clears throat> okay, so that's a conservator talking a bit about the types of the type that can um, impact silver and that we have a local power point that, I mean, sorry, a local power plant that might be impacting. Hold on while I go back now to the PowerPoint and get to the slide um, that will talk a little bit more about what's going on with the preservation environment. And hold on just a minute. Okay. Okay, can you all see that now? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Oops. Mm, I'm having a little trouble here. Take your time. It just switched back from the PowerPoint to the video and then the screen share stopped. Okay. I seem to not be able to get this conservator off my screen. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Will it allow you to close the video in its entirety? Yeah, it's just not letting me close. So. I'm sorry, folks. Give me just another minute. Try hitting the escape button on your computer. Okay. And then see if it all flows after you've hit that. There we go. Perfect. We can see your screen now. Great. Nope. Why does it go to that? When you're selecting share screen, make sure you're selecting the PowerPoint instead of that video this time so that it automatically just goes to your PowerPoint presentation right away. So when you get that share screen pop up, select the PowerPoint window. Okay. All right, sorry there for a minute. Not a worry. For some reason it's... Okay. Okay, so what I'm going to bring up now is we're going to have a brief discussion about what we did because of the tardish levels and how we approach things. So the first thing we did was we held a meeting between conservators and Mesa Verde staff, including the curator and museum technician, and we also invited 
uh, tribal community members. But you've got to understand that this problem with this project was that COVID hit and um, it impacted uh, a lot of folks' ability to travel. And we ended up, I ended up uh, consulting with various tribal silversmiths um, by phone. And then we held a meeting just between the National Park Service and the conservators because of travel restrictions and other things going on. So I'm gonna bring up another video if I can, um, very briefly. But uh, before I do that, what we did is we met, we had a meeting, we discussed silver polish levels, and we developed a silver polishing guide because one of the critical elements of this project is being able to talk about polish levels and what would be a low level, a medium level, and a and a high level and what would be necessary depending upon the degree of corrosion. So uneven corrosion is a real issue because the more uneven it is, the more application of some kind of um, abrasive action may be necessary in order to smooth out the surface. And when I mean abrasive, we're talking about a very, very gentle chemical process, but in the end, uh, there were purpley, bluish, yellow, all kinds of tarnish that just might impact the ability of the silver to age appropriately in the future. We looked at coatings. We tried a number of, of experiments where we, we took silver, little tiny squares of silver, and we treated them with different types of coatings that were reversible according to conservation principles like wax and other things. And in the end, we decided we don't want to use any coatings. It wasn't culturally appropriate. It didn't align with how these silver objects were worn and cared for in tribal communities. So we ended up uh, with just a, a very careful polishing approach where we would determine for each object the level of polish. So this is the polishing guide that we developed from that meeting. And um, I'm gonna stop share for a minute and bring up another. So can you all see this PowerPoint? Yes, we can see your PowerPoint. Great. Right. So this PowerPoint was developed by the conservators to discuss that we used at the meeting to discuss the types of silver that uh, types of conservation of silver that we might undergo and the types of corrosion that you might see. So uh, corrosion does actively do something positive. It does provide a protective layer that in essence prevents further corrosion but it also can be very uneven. And as I mentioned before, the causes of sulfur containing can pollutants include hydrogen sulfide, carbonyl sulfide, and sulfur dioxide. So also the materials that the objects come into contact with, and you saw some of that at uh, Farview, you know, they were hung on with backdrops of felt and other types of things. Um, there's Thin tarnish, which is yellow and red brown, and thick tarnish, which is dark purple or matte black. And tarnish is also an artistic and intentional application to silver to create depth in, in design. So when we're polishing, we do not want to lose that intentional tarnish. So there are many ways to prevent or reduce tarnish, including pollutant scavengers, watching the humidity and the temperature, and removing tarnish. So what we're trying to get is a consistent surface level of tarnish removal. We don't want to, we don't want to overdo. So when we use the word mechanical cleaning, that is not machine cleaning. That's a conservator working by hand using, um, as you can see, using very uh, slight tools of things like 
cotton swabs and very uh, delicate, fine abrasive particulate that isn't, you know, that's, that's almost not detectable. And uh, it has a very fine particle size and hardness. So what we're going for is, these are some before and afters from, uh, from another park. And this is a before and after from Navajo National Monument. So you can begin to get a sense of how we're approaching the work. So sometimes museums display historic silver unpolished. They're, they, they, want, they want to show the age and authenticity by not polishing. However, during my consultations, the artist's intent and their intent was more of a high polish. And they were originally items that had a fine polish. That said, these are cultural items as opposed to, you know, your silver candlesticks or forks, you know, where you get out, you know, your silver polish and you, you, you just rub as hard as you can. That's not what we're talking about here. You really want to take a very measured approach. So I'll get out of this uh, PowerPoint now and show you some before and afters from our project. So I'm sure folks are anxious, anxious to see some of those. So let me go here and let's share a screen and So if you can see this, this before and after piece, one of, the, one of the problems we were dealing with was how the Park Service applied numbers historically. So you can see that there's, the numbers are really large. Uh, there's an application of, of you know, probably clear fingernail polish B12 and it's been, there's been the application of black ink for the numbers and it's really big and uh, moving forward those numbers were removed and there was the application of a really small printed number so that it's very easy to tell uh, what the number is so you can kind of see the before there and the after of this particular piece and i'm going to bring up another one now um, hold on just a second Can you see this or? No, we're not. Okay, sorry. Right. Here's a before and after treatment. So you can see it's not, in my view, I don't think that we've gone beyond what's appropriate. This was a very challenging piece because the tarnish is part of how you understand the woven appearance of this silver bracelet. So you do want to be considerate of before and after and look for some consistent treatments. So in addition to some before and afters, I wanted to share with you also what the mounts look like. So I will show you some right now. Um, Hold on just a second. Sorry, it's taking me a minute to get down to where we were before. So you can see that, let me go on down to some of the problems that we had. So we had, um, 
We had Would you mind putting that in full screen for us, Tara? You can go yeah. down to the bottom of your screen um, by where it says 53% and how big it is. And there's that little PowerPoint icon on the far right. Okay. You'll just want to just click that, the, the closest one to the minus sign. Okay. There we go. Okay, so these are examples of some really substantial tarnation in our collection. You can see the glue that was on the back of one of those objects. You can see that this one has, well, you may not be able to see it, but this one has a loose setting issue. Uh, this one also is a loose setting. Composite materials represent particular challenges. It's, it's interesting how some items tarnished really evenly, such as this Navajo squash blossom necklace. So here are some after shots and you can begin to get a sense of the mounts and the degree of, of tarnish removal. I would say that they look shiny and when you're actually viewing them, they have a sheen, they're not quite as shiny as they look. There's light that's reflecting off the, the photography and that's, it's an issue. Uh, the Hopi overlay is a real concern because you do not want to use that dark oxidation. You don't want to, you don't want to in any way interfere with the intricacies of Hopi overlay. Uh, it's a good caution if you do have Hopi overlay and you are listening to my talk, uh, be careful in attempting to polish those types of items. Um, you can see the bracelet over on the left that, that there's still the definition that I think the artist desired. While they were cleaning and, and performing these preservation treatments, they had globs of previous polish uh, silver polish, that turquoise silver polish that so many of us grew up with. It was it was stuck in the intricacies of the items. And so, you know, they had been polished before and they may very well have been polished by Mary Coulter. So here's a drawer that has some of the conserved pieces. And I hope that you're getting a sense that there's been improvement, hopefully not to the extent that we've had any loss. This one was difficult. This didn't have a lot of black oxidation in the design. So it's not that there, that it was, I get questions about this particular piece and, and it, it did not remove the black. So um, I wanna stop right here and give people some time for questions. And thank you for bearing with me, uh, obviously, I'm not as technologically savvy. I did practice, but it doesn't reflect in this work. <laughs> but I really do appreciate you hanging with me and uh, giving me the opportunity to share with you this project. Great. Um, why don't you, let's see here. It'd be probably good if you maybe stopped your screen share for a sec, Tara. Sure. All right, and then we can, um, but keep your PowerPoint up in case we have questions, even you can share it again. Mm -hmm. um, well, that was great. No, that's really interesting. And you guys have done some incredible work. And I, I can't imagine that intricacy is the difficulty of, especially that braided piece you were saying, you know, because the, the tarnish is part of it, right? right. Um, at least, you know, the where it should be there. Um, but we have a few questions uh, that have already come up. And... Um, Let's see here. So one of the ones that showed up a couple times related to your polishing guide um, and interested in that. And um, is that available uh, for the general public or is it going to be published at some point in the near future? Or what can you tell us about that? Yes, I think the polishing guide is a bit misnamed because we're, it doesn't give you instructions on how to polish. It's, it's about polish levels that we want to achieve based on each individual item. So for example, low polish is often applied to, to um, sandcast jewelry because uh, the, if you are familiar with how Navajo jewelry is worn, you know, the sandcast, the beauty is in the silver and it's, it's not 
a bright, shiny silver. It's got a it's got a low sheen to it. So we generally use a low polish level. But but that said, if I think it's one of the more interesting documents to come out of this project. It was designed for me as a curator to communicate with conservators so that we're speaking on the same page. With that said, uh, we did oftentimes start with a low polish level and then they come to me and I would look at pictures and we would talk about it. And then we'd think about whether we wanted to go up to medium because you just want to take a staged approach. We very rarely started, although there were some pieces where I authorized a high level of polish. And so basically each object had a treatment proposal where, and I can screen share that, and that was related to the silver guide, but I'll be happy to share that with folks. And I imagine that it could easily be part of our online exhibit since there is interest in that. Um, but yeah, I think that it's hard for us as individual human beings to discuss polish levels and be on the same page, right? So it's really important that we try to speak the same language and we have examples of low, medium, and high polish to have at our disposal. Well, that's great. Yeah, no, and there's definitely several questions about that. So it seems like there is a fair bit of, of interest. People would love to see that. Um, a version of that document. Um, and then related to, um, <clears throat> somewhat related to that is, uh, there were some questions about, are there any published books related to like the entirety of the collection or, um, or pieces of it uh, that you know of? Uh, there aren't currently, we're working on this online exhibit that will, that will be sort of that, that first document that will have, um, we will have a digital image of each item and a basic description and information. Hopefully it'll, we'll, we're looking at having silver, silversmiths from different tribal communities talk about the, the different uh, culture groups that are associated with the silver. So, you know, we'd have a Diné silversmith, we'd have a Zuni silversmith talking about these uh, items and things that really, you know, are are meaningful to them, and how they hope they will be viewed and interpreted. So, to answer your question, I think that um, that will be a first start, and in, in a later guide, say to the the jewelry that she donated. So, I I want to mention that although she has documentation and some stories about particular pieces. Uh, her documentation wasn't consistent and many times we do not have the artist's name. And so I think consulting with communities and seeing if folks recognize the silversmith who created the piece, is, it's gonna be very exciting. So I'm really looking forward to that aspect of the project. Oh, that's great. Yeah, no, and that actually relates to a, another uh, question that we had um is that when she was when um when she was building her collection uh was it all from can artists that were contemporary at the time or where did she buy older pieces um you know like was it right from from directly from the artist or or what can you tell us about that well i think that that's a really good question most of the jewelry is circa 1900 so it might be 1890s 1920s 1930s i think she was buying contemporary uh, pieces for the most part. And I think, you know, she worked for Fred Harvey. They sold items in their stores at the Grand Canyon. And she might have bought jewelry directly from the artists, uh, not through Fred Harvey, but gone directly to artists and, and purchased purchased items as 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 she was, you know, doing her work there up at the Grand Canyon. And I think that um Maybe she didn't want it called a collection because she worked for Fred Harvey and, you know, she didn't want a conflict of interest or something in there, but it's hard to say. But I think that um, she had particular, particular types of things she was interested in. You might have noticed that there were several pieces that had human 
depicted human hands, pieces of turquoise that were carved as human hands. And there was a shell necklace that has representations of hands. So that was of interest to her. She was interested in, uh, she would buy multiple examples of the same type of pin, for example. So she's looking at, okay, what's the variation in this particular uh, type of, of jewelry? For example, she was really interested in bugs. She, would, she bought a number of bee pins. So, you know, she would buy the same item, but look at how each, each item is different, it's unique, it shows something. Every, every piece of jewelry has a story and how it was manufactured, what went wrong, what went right, you know, how certain elements are emphasized in one piece versus another, so. That's great. Well, so yeah, related to that then, um, uh, you know, how, maybe, and maybe I missed this, but what was the quantity of pieces in the collection? Because it looked like obviously there's a lot there and it must have taken uh, you and your team a long time. So like how many, and then how long, I, I think I missed, how, when did the project start and how long was that duration? I don't think I said how long the project uh, started. We began thinking about, uh, you know, you have to write a project proposal, seek funding. And so we started, once we deinstalled Farview exhibit and realized that we had these problems, these issues, we started drafting a project proposal in 2013. And this project was funded in 2019. And uh, the project went through a CESU agreement and uh, was, it combines both National Park Service conservators and U of A conservation students. And I, um, yeah, and so, yes, it started in 2019 and we did a number of experiments like I talked about where we used silver coupons to try to understand whether any type of coding was gonna be an option or not. And yeah, so it was funded through the National Park Service through a cultural resource project funding. And the project has a, I think it's got two and a half, three years left in the project funding. And we're hoping, we're working on the, the online exhibit right now. We have not completed the, you know, the conservation treatments, but we're starting working on the online exhibit. And in terms of, was, there was another question in there. Oh, just um, what were, how many pieces were in Oh, yes. Working? Right, so, so it wasn't just silver, you know, jewelry. There's, there's beaded work and there's, carved bone uh, jewelry, and there's just a whole, a whole group of, of types of, of jewelry that aren't, that don't contain silver, but we have 316 silver pieces that are being conserved in this project. So maybe that's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then, yes, there's a few questions about just like the, uh, the actual treatment itself is, I mean, it's, is it over the counter silver polish or a special kind, or did you try? It seemed like you tried different things, but what can you tell us about just the, the the products? I guess that you used for that. Right. Let me let me grab a treatment proposal, and okay. So in this treatment proposal. So I will read to you what is typical of the work that they do. So they clean the surface and interior with a non-ionic detergent in a deionized water to reduce loose dirt and residues from the handling. They rinse the interior if there is an interior with acetone to remove any remaining residues. They remove the catalog number and lacquer layers with acetone and add a temporary tag. They reduce the corrosion layer on the surface to achieve an overall even appearance. Corrosion reduction will start by gentle polishing with a jewelry cleaning cloth. And if necessary, this will be followed with a slurry of precipitated calcium carbonate in a mixture of water and ethanol applied with cotton swabs. So that should give you sort of an idea of the level and degree of polish and how they move from you know, cleaning to polishing. Uh, they do, Reduce the presence of any calcium carbonate by dry cleaning and cleaning using deionized water, ethanol, or acetone. And then they reapply a catalog number by printing on archival paper 
an adhering using an acrylic a great adhesive, which is removable, it's reversible, and then they constructed a custom mount. So I hope that that gives yeah. you a feel for how most of the pieces uh, were were treated. That's amazing. Yeah, there was a few questions. Is you know, can I go out to the store and get the same stuff you use? Right. Uh, it sounds like it's definitely a bit more complex than that. Yeah, I'll just say that after after working on this project, I'm I'm less inclined to to polish because uh, I just now understand the residue it leaves behind and over the counter uh, polish, silver polish has some drawbacks. Like I said, you can see that that traditional silver polish was used in the past and it ended up kind of gumming up some of the intricate work. Um, so if you ask me what I do, I'm polishing less, but I'm, I'm using, I store it in silver cloth and I use a silver cloth to, to clean up my silver. So yeah, if you ask me what I do, I wouldn't buy a polish. I would use a silver cloth and just be very careful and work it very slowly using your hands and applying pressure um, and just take a gentle approach. And remember that uh, tarnish does it does protect the object in its own way. It just starts to do it excessively. So if you've got really heavily tarnished items with deep purple coloration, you might wanna consult with, with a conservator or think about how you wanna address that. That's great. Um, yeah, there is literally like five questions about yep. that. People are very interested because, you know, other people in the Southwest probably have some similar things. Um, right. You know and, what I suggest? Yeah. You know, and another thing I think that I would suggest, because I've also intend to do this, is seek out a Navajo silversmith if it's a piece of Navajo jewelry and ask them what they recommend or if they'd be willing. To, to clean and polish it for you and uh, you know appropriately pay them for their services because they work with this material all the time and they understand how it is worn in their communities and the level of polish that that that, that object always intended to have. So you know, I really would encourage you to reach out to the community that made the piece and find solutions that way. Oh, that, that, oh, that's great. That's great. Um, so are you okay with a couple more questions? I just don't want to keep you too long. Okay. No, no. Um, there was a couple questions about um, the string because you were talking about cotton string getting cut by the, the metal wires. And so in, in some of those cases or in all those cases, did you, uh, were you and your team, did you restring things and if so what materials did you use or how, how does that how does that work well it, those cotton strung necklaces weren't aren't part of this project because they are silver uh, items but we were fortunate in that the wire hadn't cut through the cotton entirely so right now they're being stored and they're noted as damaged and we won't be able to exhibit them until we address that cotton string. Whether the conservators decide they can reuse that string and they can string it somehow, um, maybe they would just replace that section of the cotton or whether it would have to be restrung uh, remains in the future. But it does mean that, unfortunately, it's going to be really hard to exhibit those pieces until we addressed that issue. Oh, gotcha. Um, <clears throat> so then I assume one, there was a question about, you know, these are in uh, your new facility has fully environmentally controlled um, capacities, right? Right. Oh, that's such a good question that I haven't addressed. As part of this project, we're, uh, we're lining the drawers of our cabinets where you saw the conserved pieces that's been treated so that it will work, it'll act as a scavenger helping to uh, capture that sulfur and bring it into the silver cloth and not to the object. And these, um, these cabinets provide an opportunity for other types of scavengers that we can use. There's also, there's so many products out there that I've learned about as part of this project. You know, there's poster board that's been embedded with a silver scavenger so that 
can exhibit these items in exhibit cases and have this really nice backdrop that's actually been uh, treated to keep silver, to keep to scavenger the sulfur out of the environment, to keep the silver from tarnishing. You know, the important part of this is that they will tarnish again. Uh, you know, they're, they're, we just hope to retard it because we decided not to coat them. So they are just gonna, they're gonna start that process all over again. But because we've evened out, you know, those deep over tarnished areas, hopefully the, the new tarnished look will be, um, you know, more culturally appropriate. It'll look, it'll look like, and it will have been cared for, but it also will continue its natural cycle. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, because this is an ongoing process, of course. Yeah, it is. It's um, part of our world. Right, right. And you, but you, you, you and your team have really, you know, made great strides to, you know, de develop those techniques that people can use in the future. Um, so then there's a question about, um, <clears throat> let's see here. Um, did you, what about with the objects that house had turquoise? We saw some, some of the, the jewelry that had both silver and turquoise. Did is there some special process to clean the turquoise or polish it up or just is that was that pretty much left alone? No, the stones were cleaned as part of that initial surface cleaning with non-ionic detergent. Uh -huh. I would say it's really made a difference in some of the in some of the items. When they came back, it wasn't just the silver polish that sometimes surprised me. It was how much more beautiful. And, and you could really see the luster of the stones and appreciate their color in a way that you didn't before. And it's, it's hard if you aren't standing in front of the pieces, but I think if you saw them, you would see that just cleaning the stones uh, in that gentle manner made a difference. And you know, I think what I'll do is I'll ask one of our conservators, if someone wants to email me that question directly, then I will send it to the conservators so that they can answer more fully because I'm interested in it too. And I, I just haven't had an opportunity to talk to them about it. So, yeah. That's great. Well, so, um, well, so then our last question that we have here is um, you, you mentioned a little bit about the online exhibits, um, but do you have a, a timeline of when you uh, expect that to be, to be ready to, to be viewed or is there already stuff online people can check out? Well, I think it, we don't have anything online now, but I think we're going to start some, we're going to start posting perhaps on our Facebook page, some of the before and after images and discuss it that way for a while. But I, in terms of the online exhibit, because the conservation treatments are ongoing, I think we'll, we'll, we'll post that initial exhibit within a year, and then it will continue to grow as more, more work continues. And of course, we have other items beyond the silver. And so, um, you know, we're gonna wanna post those as well so that everyone can see the entirety of her, of her donation. And you might've noticed that the conservator kept calling it the Mary Coulter Collection <laughs> several times, and it's so hard not to say it. <laughs> but I can guarantee you the name of the online exhibit will not be the Mary Coulter Jewelry Collection. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm sure you guys, you'll you come up with, with something that, that right. is appropriate and draws, yeah. uh, draws folks in. But, um, well, great. Well, um, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tara Travis, for joining us this evening. And, uh, you know, you had, uh, there was a whole lot of people that tuned in, and I'm sure even more will, will want to uh, bring this up off the YouTube channel. So uh, thank you so much for your great presentation and for all your incredible work. And um, uh, thanks everybody for tuning in this evening and we'll hope to, uh, to see you all again. Uh, have a good night. Thank you and thank you to Crow Canyon. All right, have a good night. Bye.